Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, uh, we'd like to begin, if we can. Um, this is a program on constitutional government. I think this is our last uh, lunchtime meeting for this uh, uh, spring term. Um, we did have one for next week, but. Um, that was canceled, I'm sorry. James Pearson will be seeing him in the fall instead. We have with us today Heather McDonald, who is a John M. Olin Fellow at the Manhattan Institute. I think that's located in New York City. Right, but we're very disembodied, so you won't be able to find it even if you go there. So uh -huh. we all work at home. <laughs> right. Spreading, uh, spreading she's, risk. Uh, she's a graduate of Yale. and um, Gloomier spot than here. Oh, what? Well, walking around to this morning, I just felt it, Yale feels gloomier with the, 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 the gray stone rather than the red brick. So. I see. All right. But not to say and, it's uh, not intense here. Yeah, but you were smart enough not to go to any graduate school, right? <laughs> well, I started. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I started at Yale Com Comparative Literature. Oh. Going to pursue the, the, well, the world of Paul DeMond. Smart enough to drop out. Smart enough to drop out, exactly. <laughs> Too late, but. Right. Now, she's the author of, uh, of books, uh, The Burden of Bad Ideas, Are Cops Racist, and The uh, uh, Immigration Solution. Uh, her, she writes mainly for City Journal, but uh, you can also find her in Wall Street Journal, New York Times, New York New Republic. Occasionally you slip it in. Yeah. yeah. The New Criterion, and other uh, similar sounding publications. Which I've seen and, at your uh, house, actually. Uh huh. Yeah, that's good. So um, we're, we're very happy to have you. Not, I'm not quite sure, we, uh, the, the title we have is Bureaucrats versus the University. Is that more or less so? That's more or less your, accurate. It's what, your, what um, Anne and I could figure out to fit in the invitation. So um, All right. it's, it's basically bureaucrats with a special emphasis on, on uh, diversity. But I, I just want to say that I'm honored to be at this story discussion group, which uh, is famous at least in New York, if not broader than that, and um, to be on this gorgeous campus on such a beautiful day. It's hard to feel sort of depressed and pessimistic about things with the uh, red bud in bloom and the cherry blossoms, but I, I, I'll do my best to sort of make us all feel dour and, and hopeless today. Um, so I, I passed out just two articles, and, and I'm already a a cynical academic here for the day. I will not expect anybody to have read them. Um, so I'll just briefly summarize uh, the first, which was something I wrote last year in response to the ongoing budget crisis in the University of California that was getting a ton of attention in the press. Student protests at possible tuition increases, uh, university administrators telling the state legislature that they were absolutely cut to the bone when it came to uh, funding for essential university uh, functions and, and uh, activities. Um, UC San Diego was a typical supplicant. Uh, they had recently cut an MA program in electrical engineering as well as one in comparative literature had cut classes in French, German, and Spanish, and they'd recently lost three cancer researchers to Rice University who had lured them away with higher salaries. So this looked grim, and yet that year the university had announced uh, the creation of an entirely new bureaucratic sinecure, a vice chancellor for equity, diversity, and inclusion. And as is the case with all such new posts, this was incredibly redundant with an already massive diversity infrastructure that extended through the chancellor's office into provosts, into committees, uh, you name it. I mean, the, the list of, of various diversity functions l takes up an entire paragraph. Well, this went out on the web and, and got a certain amount of attention. And I received a very snippy email from a professor at the Scripps Institute of Oceanography in La Jolla uh, accusing me of being insensitive to the values of diversity. His wife was 
part of the diversity infrastructure, herself being a faculty equity advisor. Uh, and basically um, accusing me of, of all the various sins of which you're so familiar here at the university, you know, of, of in lack of appreciation for multiculturalism, blah, blah, blah. So I said, well, um, Professor Charles, Christopher Charles was his name, thank you so much for your letter. Um, I am sure that a university given that it is dedicated to reason and rational inquiry and the very careful marshalling of its public resources would not think of creating this massive new office unless they had documented the need for it. So this new Vice Chancellor for Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, whose core function, of course, is riding herd on faculty hiring and admissions, um, given that you're creating it, I assume that you can point me to some of your fellow faculty members who have actually discriminated against qualified female and minority faculty candidates. Uh, who are these professors? Please name some names. Or please give me some examples of any qualified minority and female uh, candidates who have come to UC San Diego and have been turned down because of their race and gender. Uh, again, this would be presupposed by creating a policeman function like this. Or I said, I'll, I'll make it even easier. Give me an example of a single minority or female faculty candidate who was <coughs> overlooked by any department in UC San Diego, and thus you need the new Vice Chancellor for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion to make sure that you are not overlooking these trove of qualified candidates out there. So Professor Charles wrote back and said, well, actually, um, the problem that you mention with the pipeline, uh, that there is no available minority and, and, and female candidates that are overlooked is so severe that policing the faculty is virtually irrelevant. And the same applies, of course, for graduate and undergraduate admissions. So this, to me, was a particularly depressing moment because since I'm not in the university, I still can harbor a few illusions about it, which was that at least in the sciences, there would be a, a load of, of reasonableness and commitment to the truth. But no, even there, you have this divided consciousness where somebody who understands that, of course, the idea that new bureaucracy layered upon existing bureaucracy <coughs> to, is necessary to find these precious, preciously valued minority and female candidates, when in fact the reality is, is that there is not a single university on this earth, at least this earth of the United States, that is not desperately seeking the same, uh, the same finite and inadequate store of candidates. So here's a scientist that, that is prey to this extraordinarily divided consciousness. Um, in fact, UC San Diego, other scientists, their engineering department basically finding minority engineers is hopeless. So diversity for them is all about women. And they have a routine where if you cannot come up with a way to lower your standards for hiring sufficiently in order to come up with any female candidates to even interview, they then declare themselves eligible for the excellence candidate. So you can't hire anybody within the traditional means, but nevertheless, you create an excellence position that allows you to hire a uh, female engineer. Now, UC San Diego is, of course, not unique in this. At the same time that, again, the UC system is, is racked with budget cutting, 
UC San Francisco last year created a vice chancellor for diversity and outreach. I was recently at uh, Ohio University. Their ratio of administrators to faculty tipped in 2000. So for the last decade, they have had more bureaucrats than faculty. Um, at the same time that faculty lines are going unfilled because they claim not to have the uh, sufficient funding, physical maintenance is, is cut. And yet in 2009, they too created a new diversity, access, and equity office with a new provost to run it. Of course, it was redundant uh, with the Office of Institutional Equity and their various um, diversity ombudsmen throughout the uh, university. I gave you the article I wrote on the Harvard, which um, in penance for Larry Summers, completely reckless and unacceptable comment about the possible uh, spread at the outer reaches of, of um, the cognitive curve uh, of different distributions of male and female math skills as a one possible hypothetical, merely speculative explanation for the lack of gender parity in uh, math and sciences. So in penance for that, Harvard coughed up $50 million, which presumably could have gone far to create uh, more scholarships for needy students, um, more books in the library, more uh, field trips for people from Dorchester or Roxbury to visit Harvard's extraordinary museums, say, all of these, Hip -hop. one could imagine, Hip -hop excuse me? Breakfast. Huh? Hip hop breakfast. No, keep, keep hot breakfast. Keep hot breakfast. They canceled that already. They've canceled it. They did. They took it away. The most important meal of the day. Gone. Hot <laughs> breakfast. So, so you're now having like pop tarts in the dorms and. Uh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> in order that, in order that. <laughs> well, bring it up with the. Bring it up with the senior vice provost for diversity and faculty development. <laughs> Uh, who maybe for diversity, you could have diversity breakfast. Name them a diversity breakfast for that's hot as well as cold. Um, again, premised on the idea, presumably, that Harvard was not doing enough to think about diversity and equity. Um, yet, as a senior uh, professor and, and, um, and uh, administrator told me the, the number of females offered tenure each year was etched in his soul. This was something that was so much of an obsession. Um, so what's curious to me, again, as, as I still hold on to these atavistic notions of the academy as a place where evidence matters, um, the diversity bureaucracy is based on a demonstrable lie. It is a lie that is disproven every time a faculty gets together to make a hire. All of you people are living this. You know the pressures that are exerted upon you to try and find more minority and female candidates. And yet, this diversity bureaucracy grows and grows. Now, what exactly does it do? And let me know if I'm beyond my time. Here is um, Berkeley has a vice provost for equity inclusion and inclusion who pulls in at his base salary about $200,000 a year. That doesn't include summer teaching stipends, uh, uh, you know, reimbursements for travel. And he presides over a staff of 17. So all told, this is an office that easily uh, costs the California taxpayers a million dollars a year. Uh, in, in UC Berkeley, again, let's imagine that Berkeley does not care enough about diversity, so they need a vice provost for equity and inclusion. So what does he do? Well, 
Last year, a few hardy college Republicans were rash enough to resurrect the uh, affirmative action bake sale trope. This was because Jerry Brown had on his desk uh, for yet another time a um, bill that a California State Assemblyman from Los Angeles had, had kept on sending through, send, kept sending up to, to Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger's desk, who would veto it, uh, and he was ever hopeful that maybe Brown would sign it. This would officially end Prop 209 in California, which is the voter initiative in 96, which ostensibly put an end to race and gender preferences in the state of California. Of course, every college system in, the, in, in um, California, whether it's the UC system, the Cal State University system, or the community colleges, has tied themselves into knots to come up with ways to totally violate the law in admissions and in hiring. But, but we wanted to make it official. So this bill was awaiting signature of, of Brown. And so, so uh, the college Republicans at Berkeley decided to have a affirmative action bake sale. I'm sure you're all familiar with this. You offer various tasty baked goods at, at a different sliding scale of, of price. And Asians, of course, actually, you know, I think the Berkeley people didn't have the courage to price it accurately. Asians weren't charged the highest, which is, of course, would be appropriate because there's no group in California that is more discriminated against in admissions than Asians mm -hmm. um, because they already, <laughs> you've, you've experienced, you're a reject from Berkeley, so you ended up in your second best choice. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Maybe graduate school, graduate school. Um, take it up with, with Gibor Brasri, the Vice President for Equity and Inclusion. Um, so, so they were offering their sliding scale. Asians weren't at the top, whites were. And then below them came uh, women. They got cheaper, $1.50 for bagels, and um, minorities got $1.75. So Gibor Basri, the Vice President for Equity and Inclusion, one would think, okay, maybe if you're for outreach and keeping community relations harmonious, because we know that there's, as we were talking about last night, universities are such threatening places for minority and women to the extent that we need to create official safe spaces where you can go and feel your valued as a woman because otherwise <laughs> it's very threatening to be a woman in a university. Uh, you would think that maybe he would explain things to these protesters. Of course, the bake sale got enormous attention. The national media was there. Protest, protest. Did Brasri try and explain the purpose of this and say, well, actually, we believe in free speech. It's Berkeley, guys. They're trying to make a point of affirmative action? No. What did he say? He said, this is something that is hurtful for minority students because they feel that it says that they are undervalued. Well, of course, he gets it completely wrong. The opposite is the case. It's showing that they are so valued that they get to pay uh, less than everybody else. So that's, that's what this guy does. He doesn't. He doesn't calm tensions, he inflames them. Now nationally, what is the picture? The, um, the ratio nationally of, of administrators to faculty tipped in 2006. From 06 to 09, uh, the university structure added 72,000 non-teaching positions. Why? campuses have suddenly gotten that much more complex to run, I don't know, uh, what all these bureaucrats are doing that were not, they were not doing five decades ago is a mystery to me. I, I don't know why this is necessary. Harvey suggested an explanation last night. Part of it is the federal government, which sucks up money, spews it back with, of course, lots of reporting requirements and strings attached. So there's the the feeding of the federal red tape uh, beast, I don't know. Um, but this diversity infrastructure and the larger bureaucracy infrastructure has made the recent 
uh, wave of student protests look particularly foolish. I have always wondered why anybody pays attention to student protest, because by definition, they don't know anything. And yet, <laughs> there we are saying, let's listen very carefully to what the students are saying. They are saying that uh, we need more diversity hires. Uh, we don't have enough female. Well, let's listen to the students. Or, or they think that we should divest from South Africa because they understand so much uh, about the economy, having tried to run businesses themselves, having tried to hire, having tried to raise a family. They understand about capitalism. So let's listen to what the students say. So we've had a bunch of protests um, let me return to the University of California system against tuition hikes. UC Davis had their little Occupy Wall Street protest um, that got pepper sprayed. This is very exciting. Excellent. The campus pepper sprayed. This was caught on tape. And so now we have a police state at the University of California at Davis. Um, so there they are protesting against tuition hikes. And my view is, well, who are you guys protesting? Take it to the administration, guys. Ask them why they have been bulking up on the diversity chancellors instead of uh, creating more classes in undergraduate chemistry, in, in more introductory chemistry classes. But with their usual uh, uh, perfection of getting things wrong, the, um, the students completely miss the boat. Uh, so let's, let's re close with a return to our friend Gibor Basri of uh, the University of California at Berkeley, their vice chancellor for equity and inclusion. Notice that UC San Diego, which created their new vice chancellorship, has one up them. Vice Berkeley already had the vice chancellor for equity and inclusion. Well, UC San Diego has one for equity, diversity, and inclusion, so they've got three, so that's obviously a more important um, position. So Basri uh, participated in some of these tuition uh, protests and said that um, rising tuition gives him heartburn. Well, if he's got so much heartburn, how about he starts divesting his 17 staff lines in his office? Uh, he could even give up his own salary or cut it by half, but instead um, he is going to egg the students on to demand what he says that we believe, note the royal, royal we, that a college education is not a private right but a public good. Um, and one of their goals is and Andrew Ross at NYU. I don't know if you guys are in the humanities. If you recall, in 96, um, Andrew Ross, who had been lured from Princeton uh, at enormous cost to NYU and is the professor of social and cultural analysis, he published in uh, his journal, Social Text, uh, the wonderful Sokol hoax of uh, postmodern discourse that was um, a, a perfect satire, so perfect that, of course, it went right, right by Andrew Ross and got published with, with um, much, much pr pride, I'm sure, at this deconstruction of the discourse of, of advanced physics. Andrew Ross is spearheading a um, Occupy Wall Street movement to demand the forgiveness of, of federal college loans. Um, and, and, and so that's one of the movements with Basri and Ross of free college tuition, which would, of course, um, merely fuel the bureaucratic bloat all the further by, by uh, giving it an endless source of funds. So I, I lay out the facts for you guys and um, just ask <laughs> what is to be done, and uh, has anybody pushed back against it, or is this, is this a um, behemoth that, that simply can't be stopped? And thank you for your attention. Well, thank you, uh, Heather, for this uh, fine, uh, value-free presentation. <laughs> well, we, have some, we, have we come out of the uh, Straussian tradition. We believe in values and virtues yeah. here, so yeah. thank you.
Right. Uh, I, I have to say that uh, uh, some of us have to leave a uh, quarter to right. and for a memorial service. But, uh, so, and when, when we do, uh, our friend Dean Eastman will, will uh, take the chair. Thank He's you. a veteran teacher. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, does it really? Yeah. How strange. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. What does it feel like? Because, <clears throat> because it is so clear, and when you ask them for facts to back up uh -huh. their position, there were none. Because it's so clear that this whole thing is uh, a house of cards or built on something uh, really just fiction. Mm -hmm. What do you think is the real motivation here? I mean, these are not stupid people. So they must understand themselves that <clears throat> the inadequacy of their defensive position <laughs> The professor who emailed you, you emailed him. When when you asked for facts, he didn't give you facts. He gave you know, obfuscation and, and right. circulating around. So, what do you think is motivating? I I ask. I throw it back to you. You guys live in this world. I I don't know. I mean, so so he said he admitted. Um, it is a virtual irrelevancy. They are not out there. They are not there. And and we all know. There's a bidding war. Harvard gets first shot. Uh, then Yale, we go down the ladder. Everybody's being sucked up. It's at least in the case of minorities, but I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm sure it's happening with females as well. And certainly it's happening in students. They're being sucked up one, one or several grades above their capacity. And this is, um, you probably know the academic mismatch theory of Richard Sander. This is extremely hurtful to minority students that are being placed in academic uh, environments that is above their head, they're learning less. So, so he admitted that, but then, so what did he continue in his email? It basically was, was a, a repetition of what he'd already said, which is that, well, um, we have racial tensions on campus, but that, of course, is being stoked they make it worse. They're being stoked by this lie that, again, we need safe spaces where, in <coughs> fact, there is not an environment in human history that is more open and compassionate to women and minorities than a university <laughs> campus. It doesn't exist. I graduated from Yale in 78. This, uh, they became co-ed in 69, I believe. So I, I started in 74. Fairly recently after co-education, Yale, as you may know, is currently the subject of a federal investigation by the Civil Rights Office of the Department of Education responding to this preposterous complaint filed by 16 recent alumni and current students at Yale, charging that Yale violates Title IX in maintaining a hostile learning environment to women. Now, if ever Yale was going to be hostile to women, it would have been right after co uh, started coeducation, if ever, if ever. In fact, when I was at Yale, there wasn't a single faculty member there who wasn't absolutely committed to my success and the success of every other female there. And for me to pretend that I faced a moment of discrimination would have been the height of self-delusion. And yet here we are, 30 years, 40 years later, after turnover of what would have, if ever there would have been sexist faculty, it would have been then. Since then, we've got all these new people who are, again, 100% committed to everybody's success, but especially <coughs> women and minorities. Guys, white males, sink or swim, fellas. But Yale sends this up to the feds, and the feds say, you're right. This looks plausible to us. We're going to investigate it. It's, it's implausible. It's 100% it's implausible. What is, 
what is motivating plausibility and reason. I and think data I fail. think I think I have as as I get older I have to discard my hope for reason. <laughs> it it pains me, but I feel like juvenile. I feel like I've I have to become a stoic and understand that human beings are perfectly capable of holding two completely contradictory ideas in their heads at the same time. And it makes them feel good. They know that the facts do not justify the need for a diversity bureaucracy, and yet they feel if we create one, is it magical thinking? Is it a totem that if we create this bureaucracy, we will somehow conjure forth a previously undiscovered trove of, of minority women? Is it Okay, we've got the press. So whenever you have a blow up on campus where some fraternity does something really stupid in a excess of, of uh, adolescent hijinks and dares to buck the PC orthodoxy, for instance, to be honest, you know, what, what created the <coughs> University of San Diego uh, UCSD ch vice chancellor was a, uh, what had happened in the year before was the infamous Compton cookout that then turned out was probably provoked by somebody off campus, but they sent around a invitation that mocked um, uh, sort of ghetto chic. And, and so this, of course, again, something like this happens and everybody sends out a big cry of of delight because it means that they get to protest. They get to cut classes and go do some protests at how unsafe it is to be a minority or a female on campus. Yale had a, um, a fraternity that, uh, and, and fraternities at Yale are completely marginalized, as I'm sure that, I don't even know if Harvard, I, I had no idea that there were fraternities when I was at Yale. And Harvard may have some too, and they're probably just as much sort of told to mind their manners and stay silent in the, in the uh, corner. But so this fraternity had a hazing ritual where um, uh, they had their pledges walk blindfolded through the old quad chanting, um, no means yes, yes means anal. So tasteless yes. <laughs> Threatening? <laughs> no. No. How about girls, you hear this and you say, oh, boys, they are so immature. Um, I've got a chemistry exam to study for. Let them go do their stupid little blindfold hazing. I'm going to whoop their ass tomorrow. And I'm going to get 100 and they're going to, no, instead we have to feel, I need a safe space. <laughs> Because these idiotic deeks are, are, are doing this, uh, are, are having this hazing ritual. So, so I, I don't know. I mean, again, you have, I think there's a fear, frankly, um, to be honest, excuse me, but I'm going to speak honestly. I am not impressed with the courage of academics. I have not seen a lot of people stand up and say, um, excuse me, we don't need to fund a vice chancellor for equity and diversity inclusion because we have just spent a hundred hours of faculty time in our hiring committee looking for female and minorities and I can tell you they're not there. <coughs> and if you're not Harvard, you don't get first chance. So I don't know, I think it's, it's cowardice. It's not willing to be picketed by the Women's Center or the AFAM LAT Center. It could also be <clears throat> for personal gain. I look at Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton in a different area, different arena, but not completely dissimilar for, for the region of, of political ground and theater. Uh -huh. And they will try to, to develop all sorts of uh, additional angst about any particular incident because it means they will get additional money and they get additional attention. Is there something equivalent going on on the campus? I mean, the people who are getting these positions and these salaries for them, 
there certainly is some benefit. Right. Is there, is there a personal motive involved? Well, I mean, I, I suspect that, um, like Harvard's um, senior vice provost for diversity and faculty development, she is a black woman. So I think a lot of these, the infrastructure does allow you to get your minority and female headcount up and accrediting agencies, of course. I mean, the whole thing is just a, a Ponzi scheme of mutual pressure. Accrediting agencies go around and make you count. You do your bean counting and do your diversity. So uh, I think a lot of this does get, it's a way to hire outside of the traditional academic chain to the extent that, you know, there is a semblance of um, standards left. So, so that's another possibility, yes. Is it possible yet to, to measure the cost of all this stuff in terms of fac faculty quality, teaching quality in pursuit of this phantom? I call it a phantom because you haven't quoted any of these people as saying what's the resting place, what's the goal of the quest for diversity, and right. I, I don't know what it would be. Anyway. Right, right. Uh, I have asked that question myself. Are we looking for proportional representation? Um, but the costs, I mean, uh, nationally, uh, the, the 72,000 non-teaching positions who were added between 06 and 09 is 3.6 billion. Um, that's a lot of money. Again, I, I mean, there's so many ways we could spend that money to create a, a, a devotion to beauty. I mean, I, I believe that, that coming from the humanities background, obviously I would hope that the sciences are relatively untouched, but I, frankly, being a pessimist, I, 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 um, I don't think that's gonna last. I think you, you will start to have uh, lowering of standards in the sciences to, to feed the quota beast. But in the humanities, I mean, I, we should all be down on our knees before these works of, of greatness and beauty and to, to give students more opportunity to study, I, I don't know. So the, the cost is massive in terms of, of the funds going into these sinecures, but also the opportunity cost of who's not being hired. And, and um, I mean, this began obviously with the pressure to bring in underqualified minority students in campuses, uh, City University of New York in, in the late 60s and early 70s, this was one of the, we all know the stories, you know, Irving Crystal coming out of it. Uh, it really was the poor man's Harvard uh, that was free tuition and had enormous, enormously demanding standards and, and was a serious academic institution. But there was a protest that it was too white. And so they, they lowered their academic standards to bring in more minority students uh, who were completely not ready for college education, had to create not just massive departments of remediation, but also majors that they could succeed in. So you started adding on the ethnic studies majors, um, which obviously there's some, some reason for thinking about identity and history up to a point, up to a point, but to have an entire faculty devoted to it, uh, I think is a distortion of, of um, human history and a trivialization of it. And I mean, I've looked at history departments uh, and, and you all know what's happening. Uh, you have the balkanization of, of history, where everything now is looked at through the lens of different identity groups. Political history, diplomatic history, military history is, is extremely underrepresented. But if you want to teach, um, you know, black women in, in Charleston in 1830, that's up there on the list. So uh, the costs are huge, but it's, again, I. I, I, it's up to you guys to document that, but I, but I think that it is enormous, and it has, um, it's distorting the curriculum. 
uh, up to a point and, and, and fueling among some students, I hope not everybody, uh, a victim self-identity that they are being taught to think of themselves as victims. Again, for women, I mean, this is particularly ludicrous. But undoubtedly, there is a subset of female students who are going out, having graduated that, looking, being taught to look for the rest of their lives for signs that they are in an unsafe environment. And uh, they will make life miserable for their employers, and they will then pressure government for more, um, more government programs to, in, in turn, pressure employers to sue employers for more demands for pay equity. I mean, the, the ludicrous idea now that we need yet another federal law because on average um, there's still a disparity in pay that does not adequately take into account career choices that women voluntarily make on their own. But now we're going to have more pressure on employers to, to artificially change what they're hiring. So anyway, the, the costs, once you start to think about it, are, are endlessly a circle of endless um, uh, implications. Ruth? Well, when one does protest, I'm not going to, I don't disagree with anything that you have said, but you're looking for the reasons. And I don't think that one should give up reason because the reasons are, are there. Uh -huh. Firstly, I do think it begins with the government. When you come to the university and you protest, they say, this is demanded by the government. In other words, compliance with um, proving the fact that you are not discriminating mm -hmm. is something Right. That they have the excuse, and uh, I think that many people who are so afraid of litigation, certainly afraid of offending bureaucracy, mm -hmm. um, use that <coughs> as the uh, reason for, that mm -hmm. is their reason for, sub you know, submitting departments to this kind of thing. Um, surely we could all come up with a <coughs> fantastic proof of what you're saying, and some of it quite comical. Mm -hmm. um, and it is. It, not just the cost, of course it perverts uh, real education, but the other part of it is also reasonable that the, as soon as you have uh, affirmative action and you're hiring people on the basis of affirmative action, it stands to reason that those hired on the basis of affirmative action are going to support mm -hmm. further affirmative action. Right. And so uh, as long as you had departments that sort of prided themselves on uh, choosing the best and the brightest someone as bright as they are, certainly, mm -hmm. and arguing only about who could be as bright as they were, and sometimes not making appointments because, of course, no one in the world is as bright as they were. <laughs> that is a, a wow. here in, in some departments, as you know, <laughs> uh, for many years. Um, that wouldn't be you she's referring to, I'm sure not. No, no. no. Uh, She's always they, inclusive, they, right? They never touch philosophy. Um, but, uh, but seriously, it then becomes, uh, mm -hmm. as you were saying, Right. Uh, reason for perpetuating this, and with each year, the perpetuation um, increases. Mm -hmm. So that um, if you are someone who thinks that you were hired uh, because of affirmative action, are you going to hire someone who is really better than you, mm -hmm. who is really there because they are true scholars, and because they? I mean, that is very threatening. Yeah. And what you want is a system that. The reason that you got there. Right. So there could be nothing more reasonable, as far as I can tell, mm -hmm. than the process that we are now uh, witnessing. And, uh, and I, I think, of course, you cannot expect uh, what you call courage from people who go into the academy, because the very nature of people who go into the academy is people who want to withdraw uh, from, uh, from the kind of uh, uh, ferocity that you see in the public, in, in politics. It's got to yeah, yeah. We save we save our courage for footnotes. <laughs> <laughs> so it's got to be fought in, in politics. I think. I think huh. If there's ever going to be a change, if that's what you're really pushing for, uh -huh. it's it's got to start. You know, it's got to be fought at the public at the at the political level. And when 
political level, but California begins to demand this change and reversal. It'll come. Hmm. Interesting. Well, we did, I mean, yes and no. I, 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 I would say that Prop 209 is, is refutation of your point. The, the, the voters of California voted to end racial preferences. So they gave cover to every public university in the state to say, it stops now. We are going back to merit. What did the universities do? Come up with every possible twisted admission scheme, call it holistic, comprehensive, you name it, all a bunch of lies to come up with surrogates for continuing affirmative action in admissions and hiring. So. I don't believe it, and it is not for me to, um, to criticize and to say that you guys have to do your part as well, because you know, I think we can all be self-righteous about the difficulties it is to stand up and take it and, 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 and stand up against the mob. But nevertheless, um, you can say it's, it's, it, it meets one test of reason to continue with, it. once the system is set up, every action within it is reasonable. But there's another test of reason which is simply against an external standard of truth, which again, it is not reasonable to say that we need more diversity structure. That, that is what the demonstrable lie is. And I don't know if every, if within every department there was one faculty member who just kept on saying publicly, we've looked, guys, and they're not out there, maybe it would work. So I, I, I don't know. I, you know, you say, don't, don't look to us, have the taxpayers, but the taxpayers have tried, and then the university decides to keep on going. So it's, it's got an internal dynamic now. Um, <coughs> That is just just astounding. Yes. I was going to ask. Uh, maybe I'll play devil's advocate um, in the position that is there always a trade-off? Because I think right now you're presenting the position that there's a trade-off between achieving diversity and merit, um, whether that's in getting certain members of, uh, of faculties or undergraduate admissions. Or things. And I, 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 at some points, I would probably agree with you. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of colleges that, in order to achieve the diversity quotas that they want to get, they do sacrifice merit. But I think at a place like Harvard or at Yale, with an applicant pool of over 30,000 young men and women, mm -hmm. and they're only looking to fill 1,600 spots, and the diversity quota for Hispanics is only 10%, so they're only looking for 160 mm -hmm. Hispanics out of 35,000 applications. I think they can probably find 160 Hispanics with equally qualified merit-based ap uh, applications as whites to fill those spots, mm -hmm. and so in that regard, there's. I'm not sure if they're. I'm not sure if the university is sacrificing a trade-off. They're getting diversity, and they're not really sacrificing the caliber of the applicant. Mm -hmm. um, the faculty picture might be a little bit more the complicated. The, the faculty. The faculty, and I'm not as familiar with that. But I guess my question would be, what, what, uh, what, what would your response be to the sense that is it always a trade-off or? Are there situations where we can achieve both? Uh huh. Well, this came up last night. As a matter of fact, um, it, it may be that in one or two institutions in the country, that uh, with very small student bodies, you can in fact pick off the uh, minorities that have meet the traditional standards of admission. And you know, it's, it's always ludicrous to me to have the university say, well, we don't care about SATs, or those are irrelevant. They're only irrelevant when it comes to minorities. You know, when, when Berkeley is choosing its Asians and whites, they are calculating SAT out to like 10 decimal points. Um, but then they turn around and say, okay, now it's time to, hire, to uh, admit blacks and Hispanics, and all of a sudden, oh, SAT, it's so, it's so unpredictive. Um, 
but it but it may be that with um, that Harvard can find black and Hispanic students that are equal in everything to the whites and Hispanics they admit. Although Harvey said last night that the outcomes don't show that, that there is a um, stratification of performance over the course of those years. But even if that's the case, if there are two institutions that are able to not have double admission standards for undergraduates, that's it. Because what starts to happen as soon as you go down, the rest of the colleges is you've, you've run out. You have run out. The SAT gap is so big that you are inevitably have admissions that are basically at least one standard deviation different. And um, again, I, if you're not familiar with the research, I urge you to look at the mismatch theory that, that Sander has done. In the tradition of you know, the emerging empirical work in law school is very quantitative of trying to estimate um, how much this is setting back the minority students that you're admitting to classes that they are not fully prepared for. They learn less. So again, um, it is as a practical matter for the universe of, of uh, the academy a trade-off. Uh, uh, let me insert something. <laughs> um, well, in the situation you described, Har Harvard could uh, get the same results uh, without accepting the principle or the policy of affirmative action. Right. Just under and then pick uh, some diverse samples of merit. But instead, Harvard follows a policy of affirmative action and hires these people to enforce it because it wants to set an example, a deliberately bad example for the rest of American education. So that, so we, we don't need this, actually. Uh, we don't need affirmative action because we can attract a very good people uh, even. <laughs> Um, it's, it's true that uh, the, the results still may differ somewhat, say, for uh, minorities at Harvard uh, as, as compared to whites and Asians, but still uh, our, our black students are pretty good. So, um, so, so we don't need it, but uh, because we believe in it for the rest of the country, uh, we uh, adopt the policy and, uh, and as you say, fund it uh, quite generously. So and and just, I mean, example, at Duke University, I wrote about this for, for the Weekly Standard. Um, Duke, you know, that you would assume that Duke is a pretty competitive university. It's not Harvard, nothing is, but it's still, it's still, you know, got, I don't know what the ratio is of applicants to, to admits, but it's high. And um, there too they have, it's a one standard deviation difference in SATs, and as a result, I mean, it, it's, it's very interesting Black students show up at Duke overwhelmingly wanting to major in the sciences, in fact, at a slightly higher rate than, um, than whites and Asians. So they're actually not coming to Duke or other students wanting to major in black studies. But the attrition of, of blacks from the sciences is at twice the rate of whites because they're not prepared and, and they're they're in science classes that are not pitched to their current level of understanding. And so they then uh, give up on the sciences where they might not have if they'd been to North Carolina State University. So as I say, Duke, one standard deviation of SAT difference. And you better believe that's going on every place in similar to qualified schools. There's a question over here. This, this, uh, um. Lady's been waiting. Okay, you. sorry. <laughs> um, um, thanks. I, I agreed with most of your analysis, and and especially the the point that it's rather ridiculous to claim that that universities are a hostile environment for for women and minorities. But I'm wondering. I mean, it seems like in addition to the lack of courage and um, other other causes underlying it. I mean, I would have thought that there are also much more noble-minded things going on that you're not quite mentioning. I mean, the most obvious thing is just that. You know, we can all 
agree in principle on equality of opportunity, I guess, and that you know, every all the groups should be given an equal chance, no one should be held back, but then you have this problem that in fact the results are very unequal. And and um, then the, if the, if you have the principle, well, you know, all of the groups in fact have equal abilities, then it shouldn't really turn out that you have very different outcomes. And so so then you think, well, it must be that in fact the opportunities weren't equal if we have such different outcomes. And so there's a kind of, even though it's so contrary to what we see around us, you think, well, it must be that they were held back in some way. And of course, 50 years ago, it really was true that people were, you know, so, I mean, to me it seems like, in addition to the lack of courage and so on, there's just a lot of attachment to a certain principle of justice. Of, mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, no, I agree. And um, it cannot be stated strongly enough how much this country violated its core principles and how shocking it is how recently uh, the country lived without really much trepidation or, or, or concern about the uh, or awareness awareness of the of the situation of blacks I mean it is it is simply astounding um, but I guess I would say that then you, you start with that and, and an awareness of, of um, what the legacy of that was, but it behooves you to be very careful then about remedies and whether they are in fact appropriate and, and helpful. Um, and I think it is no longer the case that this country is indifferent um, or ignorant about the, the uh, condition that we put blacks in and that we haven't been trying for the, since the 60s to make amends for that. Um, and at some point, I think you have to decide where, where's the next step? Is, is it possible to produce equality of outcomes now through further either government actions or programs in the absence of um, self-help and, and different individual decisions to produce uh, a greater applicant pool? So it is not the case that on average um, blacks are making the same decisions about studying and childbearing as people that are in a more affluent world are. And, and until that changes, there's not a whole lot that can be done. But a, a second response I would say is this is where um, the mismatch theory, and I'm sorry to repeat myself all the time, but I think people have ha felt this intuitively, those who were skeptical about affirmative action for 30 years have been wondering, is this really helpful? Is it really helpful to put somebody into a setting? I would not be, I would not be a happy person at MIT. And the idea that anybody would be doing me a favor to expect me to compete at MIT in the sciences is absurd unless you really believe that, that people are going around with this well of completely untapped potential because they have existed in unequal environments for so long. I, I just think at the scale at which we are practicing affirmative action, it's unlikely that all those students that we're bringing in under double standards are, have not had an opportunity yet to show their potential. and what we're seeing is that that's not the case because like at, at this empirical study of Duke, they're not doing well. At law schools, law schools again, my, my law school dean at Stanford told me, he came out of the 60s, he had a civil rights background, wonderful man, very well-meaning, thoughtful, he said that if we didn't practice affirmative action at Stanford, we wouldn't have a single minority student in, the, in our student body. So 
the intentions may be good. I would, I would say that some of the intentions, though, are self-regarding and that bureaucrats want to look out and, and faculty want to look over their diverse realm. It makes them feel like they are providing a refuge from the rest of redneck America that is pervaded with racism, but they, in their, in their generosity and wisdom, are going to uh, take in their little, little uh, uh, you know, subjects and create their carefully, artistically arranged, uh, diverse student body. But, but that they should be able to see that this is not working, because in, in, in law students, the, the black rate of failure in classes, the blacks remain at the bottom of their law school classes. They are failing the bar at much higher rates, so they are not doing them a favor. So at some point, you have to say, okay, even granting you that your intentions are purely selfless, you have to look at whether this is working anymore. A quick follow-up, Harvey, uh -huh. on this. A question to the questioner. Why do you measure equality of opportunity in terms of groups? rather than of the individuals. Because, of course, the, the two conflict. <coughs> you make your choice as I, to which you prefer. Mm -hmm. I wasn't trying to articulate my own view, but just how I thought that the other side was seeing it. And, um, well, because all of the groups, I mean, they shouldn't be seen as groups, but in fact, different groups have different outcomes where we sort of, in principle, would think, well, it should just be at all individuals should be given basically the same opportunities, and then. But if that were in fact the case, and and there were not differences like that, differences in inherent abilities among different groups, then all individuals being given equal opportunities should lead to all groups being basically equally represented if they were given equal opportunity. And so, if all of those premises apply, it's hard to understand why the outcomes in fact are not equal if there's not some kind of prejudice entering in. I'm not saying I accept all those premises, but just that that might be how they see it. But. Yeah, and so, I mean, this, this takes us close to that dangerous issue that the, um, was it the president of the Harvard Law School got so wrapped by Martha Minow of, you know, you're positing, is it genetics or culture? But culture, I mean, you can just see that there are, people are making different choices, and at some point you do have to look at the culture of, are, are black students who study um, uh, challenged by their peers for acting white? The answer is yes. This is not a fiction. It is going on right now. I'm, I'm writing an article about another uh, federal crusade to um, punish schools who have disparate rates of student discipline for black and white students. and. Um, I talked to a black teacher at St. Paul, Minnesota, who took a stand. And because his school, as is happening across the country, uh, schools are terrified to discipline black students now or, or suspend them. Um, and he said, you know, his student, th th when he has students that are academically inclined, they are still teased. So this is a problem. That is a problem. You've got to take that on, too. Yes. So I think one of the classic arguments um, that, or I think a very like strong argument that um, helps people who are against affirmative action often comes from minorities who are against affirmative action. Um, and I think that something that I, I mean, I, I think that it's a small subset of the people are, uh, there are, at least at Harvard, for example, that are like Latino that don't, you know, engage in the Latino club or that are African American and don't participate in any kind of, you know, African American. And I find myself as one of those few people. Um, Good for you. And people ask me why, and I mean, it's a complex answer. Um, but I guess, I guess my question would be, um, you know, when there is a certain stigma about what affirmative action does, I think it hurts minorities like myself who, you know, think affirmative action is wrong, um, want to disassociate from, you know, it comes to the point where you want to disassociate from the minority mm -hmm. completely. Um, and so how do you balance that, uh, you know, something that's part of who I am, I guess. I mean, not, I could, I could disassociate from it if I wanted to. I couldn't even disassociate from it if I wanted to because of my name. Um, so, you know, how do you do, do away with that stigma? And when I, I mean, I, I never felt like I 
didn't have the opportunities to come to Harvard. Mm -hmm. um, my parents worked really hard. I don't feel like I deserve being here more than somebody who's white. Um, you know, but how, what is your advice to people like myself that um, don't think affirmative action is wrong, don't want to play the race card, don't, uh, well, you congratulations. Yeah, well, I, you know, I, I, I salute you for not doing the ethnic huddle, which is what a lot of people do. And, and that's another just paradox of all of this, of the, the perverse administration and faculty that on the one hand, I mean, I'm, I'm just repeating all of these memes we've all heard many times, but... Um, we all know, I mean, the, the, the weirdness of saying we want to have affirmative action because of diversity, and then at the same time creating these compounds, these so-called safe spaces for minorities to go and be by themselves. Well, are we for inter integration or not? Um, so, I, I, what, what to do, I, I would hope that you are not stigmatized for not participating in the uh, Latino groups, um, and that I also hope and assume that you are not stigmatized by uh, non-Latino or black groups, that uh, people, the, I mean, the thing is, my sense is that most students, certainly, like I've written about the elite prep schools, where everybody just wants to get along. They, they've got this fabulous opportunity to create a new racial consciousness, which is no racial consciousness, guys. So you've got Andover and, and Exeter and Choate admitting all these students, and they're just good-willed people. They're good-willed people, and they get there, and Andover's dean of multiculturalism starts brainwashing these minority <laughs> students about how to think of themselves as victims and say, okay, or women. I mean, Andover has a gender center for women to go be their gender selves, give me a break. How about you guys, you faculty, just shut up. And for four years, let's have an experiment. Nobody talk about race and see what happens. And well, let's have some, we'll have a control experiment. We'll have Exeter have the, you know, multicultural dorms and blah, 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 blah. And then Andover have nothing. And let's see if those students, if those white students start abusing the Hispanic and blacks. My guess is they won't. And they don't need the diversity bureaucrats to protect the minority students from these racist white and Asians. Nobody's going to try that. So anyway, I, would, I, I just salute you for not, not um, playing that game and, and hope that you get all the education that you could possibly can out of this wonderful institution. Yeah. With uh, on the uh, prep schools or universities, it would seem that uh, diversity creates a number of jobs, whether they be sure. uh, faculty jobs or administrative jobs. And then with affirmative action, you have students that are the benefactors of, of this. And then there seems to be a sym symbiotic relationship that the more students you have of that cohort, the more jobs will be created or you'll reinforce those jobs. Right. So it would seem that to keep those jobs that you would have to stir up the students or bring in more students of that to keep things going. Mm -hmm. Now, is that, a, is that type of relationship, that symbiotic relationship between the faculty and the administrative jobs and the students, like stirring things up with protests and stuff, is that more of a, uh, an overt or is it more covert as far as, because it seems that they have similar interests. Right. And if you stir up the students, mm -hmm. that would be the most visible part of the protest sure. rather than the faculty, and it would get more public sympathy maybe or, uh -huh. or, or support. Is there any evidence of, of, of that? Well, you know, as I quoted, there's Basri, uh, demagoguing on the uh, affirmative action bake sale and injecting himself in the um, up Occupy Wall Street tuition protests and whatnot. So, yeah, I, I, I'm sure that and at, at Andover, the multicultural dean there um, does 
sort of egg on students to see see themselves as victims. Because so that would seem at some point, at, on some level of the administration, very cowardly that they wouldn't step up and say, this is, you're just trying to feather your own bed and try to keep your own job, but yet they seem to, to back away from that? Yeah, but the administration is itself just filled with all these deans and, and provosts. I mean, like to take it outside of the uh, identity politics um, context, it just, again, I mean, I, it's not a rhetorical question. I don't understand why you need all these bureaucrats now. It's just very curious. It's the student services bureaucracy. Why is being a student today that much more difficult or being, you know, running a, a college today that much more difficult that you, you need all of the deans uh, for student life? And it's also interesting because at some point, inevitably, it gets so big that it becomes contradictory and it cross-purposes. Um, you know, there's, of course, the massive sexual assault bureaucracy uh, dedicated to the notion that women are at constant threat of sexual assault um, and heaven forbid anybody whisper a word about personal responsibility such as um, you don't get drunk and take off your clothes and get in bed with a guy on a hookup because at some point you are putting things in motion that are going to sort of decide, take their own course. And yes, of course, ideally, if you all of a sudden have second thoughts, it would be nice if things ended up there. But if you really don't want that to happen, how about you don't get in bed in the first place? Is that asking too much of you very smart women? Um, so we've got this huge sexual assault bureaucracy that is not going to speak a word about women acting responsibly and taking responsibility for their own bodies. And yet at the same time, you've got another part of the bureaucracy that is passing out sex toys and sex toy literature. I kid you not, and I'm sure it happens at Harvard, but I've been at NYU at the Student Center, and I've picked up the flyers about how to get better orgasms. This is passed out by the bureaucracy. It is on nice little color-coded flyers and, and how to use vibrators. So at the one hand, they've got the, the bacchanal side of the, of the diversity of the bureaucracy. At the same time, we've got the, the Puritan, let's revive the Victorian wilting violet image of females that need protection from these awful males. So all of this is being funded, and they all coexist quite happily. Now you know what the next lunch is going to be. Got it. <laughs> Sex toilet. <laughs> no, this is just getting interesting, but I <laughs> You talk about uh, admissions, but of course there's the next phase, which is that, that students are carried through. So not only are they admitted with substandard criteria, but then the criteria for them to go through and graduate uh, also can sometimes be understanding. Yeah. You talked about law, and that's one thing, but in medicine, it's even more serious. I've talked to people on the staff at Mass General, which is one of the great hospitals in the world, and they say it goes on there with the doctors. So my question to you is, if you are going to a hospital like Mass General, yeah. and in walks a black of female course. doctor, right. do you ask to see somebody else? Right. Do I have the courage to do it? I, I, I you probably one would not have the courage, and you just, I'm not religious, but you sort of just hope at that point. I don't know. It's, it's terrifying. Because we are all, we are all polite people, and we don't want to hurt somebody's feelings. Um, but, I mean, we all know the story of the, the uh, guy who was admitted instead of Baki, you know, uh, the, the, gynecologist that ended up, and I mean, this is anecdotal, so it's not, it's not really fair, but he had a very troubled medical history. So, you know, again, I've heard from academics that the sciences will hold the line, um, and as I say, I'm skeptical, and, and as you suggest, it's already not being held. So it's, it's horrible, and as you say, I mean, uh, this is something that's been noted for a long time. There was the Yale law professor that wrote uh, Confessions of an Affirmative Action Baby and his um, Stephen 
which is Carter. Like Carter, right? I mean, that's a strange book because he admitted the stigma problem that everybody assumes you're there because of your race, and it and it undermines your just your your legitimate uh, uh, accomplishments. But I don't think he's ever gone on the record, and this is, I think. What you know, you're suggesting you have people that, that are themselves a product of this. So how are they now going to turn around and, and criticize it? So how it ends, I don't know. But um, if if the sciences can't hold the line, then then there is really nothing left. Well, it isn't so much the scientists, but the doctors. I mean, that's life and death. Most scientists don't face matters of life and death. Well, engineers, that's oh, life yeah. and death. Yeah. That's life and death. Yes? Yeah, just to maybe suggest a more positive way of approaching this, if you have, are you, if you're aware of institutions, or are you aware of institutions that have a more reasonable approach to these problems, who don't give in to wasting enormous amounts of money on extra bureaucrats, who, and, and, and maybe you're taking innovative approaches to, to the social issue. It, it, it is, a, it is a, a social problem. And, and if you could highlight those institutions and praise them mm -hmm. and give parents an idea of where to send their children, where their, where their tuition dollars are being spent wisely and not on, on um, these kind of quixotic <laughs> enterprises, then that might be an avenue to pursue rather than mm -hmm. simply being so depressed about it all. <laughs> well, that, is, that at least is a possibility. Mm -hmm. I, I just don't know of it. If there, are there any institutions that do um, try to hold a line against this? Well, in trend. preparation for this, I thought, um, I don't know if you've been following it, the Times has covered it. The um, Santa Monica Community College, which is in the community college system of, of Los Angeles. They have a very lovely pool. I go there when I'm out in California. Um, and they're uh, very- Not part of the UC system. No, that's a community college system. So you've got the- Which is separate. UC, you've got Cal State University, which is larger and less elite. And then at the local levels, you have community colleges, which are public and basically open admissions. But administratively separate? Yes, I believe so. They, they, so there's an organization of, in California of community colleges. There's the Cal State University organization and the UC system. So, I mean, there, I'm sure that there's overlap, you know, communications, they talk to each other and send each other diplomats. But anyway, so the chancellor at Santa Monica's community college, very um, forward-thinking guy, he came up with an idea of market pricing tuition because they had um, oversubscription and, and they were having to make cuts and raise tuition. So he suggested, why don't we offer students the opportunity if you, there's a class that you really need to, um, to graduate, we'll offer it for immediate enrollment at a higher price. And otherwise, you can pay the much lower price. And of course, these prices are, even with the proposed market base, really cheap. I mean, these are great deals. And, and so he had the temerity of actually introducing a market concept into the university. This produced massive outrage on the part of students who were protesting. And they had another really exciting moment where they got sort of maced a little bit by the campus police. And this chancellor, who sounds like an utter hero, he's Asian, he actually, A, defended the police and said that these students who were like trying to completely disrupt the, the uh, student senate meeting uh, deserved it and that they were, uh, you know, disrupting the peace. And for a while he held his ground and tried to, um, he tried to uh, defend the tuition pricing scheme um, and eventually caved, of course. And another, you know, innovative idea that cannot be allowed to continue. So that's been taken off the table. But in, in I, you know, I wanted to find another case where students don't get it. They're protesting the tuition 
at the same time that they've got this massive bureaucracy. Santa Monica College actually looks to have a relatively thin um, diversity superstructure. They have committees, but these may be chaired by faculty, uh, pop populated by faculty, as opposed to having a whole lot of dedicated diversity bureaucrats. They have some in the human resources division. So, so there's an example of somebody, you know, that's pretty lean in me. Now they also are heavily minority. But, but you raise the question of providing like a consumer guide to parents for places that are doing a good job without wasting a whole lot of tuition money on this ridiculous diversity fat. And frankly, I mean, that's the other reason, not for hope, but for hopelessness. Because <laughs> the consumers are really driving this, and the consumers are the problem. And this is one of the great ironies of history, that you have these baby boomer parents who grew up in the 60s um, taking their parents' credit card with them to go on their tour of ashrams and um, learning tantric yoga and fighting the establishment and saying that they are against capitalism and, and materialism. And now they have spawned college-age kids and the most important thing in their firmament is to get their kids into Harvard and Yale or Duke or um, Pomona College because credentials are all and status is the most important thing in their lives. So it looks like there are very few people that are willing to turn away from the very best university they can get their kids into because they want to be able to say, here is the implicit IQ stamp on my kid's forehead um, that proves that I'm smart and he's smart and he's into Harvard. So I actually, you know, one hears periodically David Galantner at Yale started this early on of um, believing that the internet was going to solve things or there's, you know, various um, proposals to start a conservative university like Galantner that we would get Harvey Mansfield and, and uh, you know, Ruth Wissa to teach at it. But most parents don't really care, I'm sad to say, about what their students are learning. What they care is that IQ stamp. Um, and, you know, there's Hillsdale, but again, nobody's going to, if you can get your kid into Harvard, you're not going to send them to Hillsdale, even if it's dedicated to the great books. There's St. John's dedicated to the great books. It's quixotic. You know, we, we are, the, the consumer cares about status, and that's kind of it. So how you break that, I don't know. Are there any more questions? So one interesting comment. I don't know how many debates the Republican candidates had. I don't know it was a 19-point <laughs> debate. To the best of my knowledge, not a single question about affirmative action uh -huh. passed interesting. in all these debates. Right. Interesting. Even though there's actually a Supreme right. Court case now right. tracking through on it, sure. and yet not once. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, um, it is odd. I, I mean, I've always, I, I don't understand, say, why Jews do not oppose affirmative action because they're hurt by it. But it may be that everybody thinks that Mike, you know, we have, there, one of the fictions out there is that it's not zero sum. You've probably heard this, that it actually, it's just, it's again, it's one of these irrationalities. How can it be true? You guys are maintaining a patent fiction that by having quotas for less qualified minorities, you're not hurting, there's not some people who are being hurt by this. But that's the fiction. That's the fiction that it's not zero sum. Um, and yet, so maybe everybody thinks that my kid is not going to be the one who will be hurt by it. A, a friend of mine used to work for um, Michael Kinsley and also found it very ironic that Kinsley, who's very bright, great writer, very bright, he is you know, publicly on record for affirmative action, and yet every magazine he's edited has been almost exclusively uh, edited and run by Jews. So he's not practicing what he preaches. So it may be that everybody thinks it's, it's not going to hit me or I'm not going to abide by it. I don't know. 
I think just to answer that as my experience here, I think there is a huge problem because uh, I've been involved in a lot of conversations about affirmative action and if you're part of the diversity, if you're part of non-American or minority people, the, after like less than five minutes of discussion, they're gonna say, well, you're a minority, you're probably here because of affirmative action, how you're against it. And if you're not, if you're from like, you went to a prep school or something, they're just gonna say you don't understand, you're from a prep school, you, your life was already set. So there is this thing that those people who are uh, not benefiting from it, they're scared of talking about it because they call racist or not understanding. And those people who might have benefited from it, uh, or they're part of those people who could have benefited from it, they're scared to talk about it because they're gonna start bringing up this uh, taboo that you are also, you got uh, here because of affirmative action. So no one really talks about it. It's something that, especially if you're having dinner in the dining hall, you don't wanna talk about it. Right, and yet my impression is, is that high school students are acutely aware of it. I mean, everybody knows everybody else's SATs. And so it's another fiction that we all show up at college and pretend that affirmative action doesn't exist, even though it's, again, it's like it is a demonstrable falsehood, just as every faculty department is engaged in the diversity search. And so it's a demonstrable falsehood that they're not trying for diversity. It's a demonstrable falsehood that affirmative action doesn't exist because everybody's been comparing their SATs. And they know that the black students in their class have been admitted to schools that their white peers have been rejected from, and yet we're all supposed to pretend. It's just, it's a very, very bizarre thing. But maybe this is our penance for Jim, slavery and Jim Crow, and, and we will never, we will never move beyond it. It may be, and it, it's our original sin, and um, it, it could be that there is no price we pay that is too, too high for that. Maybe you should become a diversity bureaucrat, <laughs> whom I think you stole the last remark from. But she has a question. Yes. Oh. Yeah, I want to have a question going off of Arash's question. So, if we, I mean, how, I guess, how far are we willing to go with meritocracy or strictly meritocratic admissions when you consider that a lot of the top universities are getting tons of applicants from abroad and international students, I mean, the acceptance rate for international students is much, much lower than it is for American students. It's much harder to get in from China from Korea, from places that have Singapore, that have extremely good educational systems that are producing many, many qualified applicants. And if we were to take a, a simply kind of meritocratic standard, would Harvard be 70% international, 80% international? And is that really what American universities are intended for, if you were to simply do a completely sort of standardized test, GPA-based admission? Mm -hmm. I would say if it's a private university, yes, absolutely. <coughs> Let American students study harder. It, you may seem like, how could we study any harder? Well, somehow they're doing it in China and Singapore, so um, why not? Why not? And, and especially in the sciences, which are already, I mean, I guess it's 50% foreign in, in graduate schools, in graduate um, departments, but, um, you know, it, would, it, it might be a wake-up call to American students. I, I can't believe that, and I guess what I would also say, I bet you, I bet you that those foreign students are admitted on the basis of their academic work. And I wonder whether they are doing the resume padding of, of um, building habitat for humanity in their, in their summers. Um, I think that's a waste. If we're going to have these ridiculous community service requirements, how about saying start a business and learn something about uh, the challenges of, of being an entrepreneur that none of you guys have a slightest clue about. But if we're going to do that, but, but I would say get rid of it entirely. As far as I'm concerned, your job in life as long as you have the freedom to be a student is to study. And, and it is the job of the faculty to cram as much knowledge of, of beauty and glory into your little noggins as we can fit in there. So it wouldn't bother me. Heather, would you take one more question? Sure, of course. I'm just going to add, this is a bit of a response to your remark about our penance for Jim Crow. And I, I mean, I 
understand why you lump together and why they are lumped together. Gender, the goal of gender equality, concern about inequality of women and <coughs> racial inequality. It just seems to me that they are, um, in some ways, a, a similar challenge or problem or whatever ideological, politically correct, uh, cancer infecting. I don't know whatever. You're, but in another sense, it seems to me that um, gender equality or the goal of gender equality is a much more complex and Perhaps in principle, doubtful goal to be, or difficult goal to envision mm -hmm. than racial equality, because it seems there may be differences between the genders, which very complex differences, somewhat malleable, but nevertheless they may play themselves out in all different ways in academia and business and all other walks of life. And so it, it seems that in principle, the goal of racial equality. Um, uh, I, for one, am 100% uh, behind that, and it seems it's a, a debate over tactics, and I am not in principle opposed to affirmative action if it can be shown to me that over two or three generations it would create good results. It seems that my doubt is mostly concerning whether it does create those results. Mm -hmm. And it seems, whereas gender equality, again, I, I am somewhat sympathetic to some levels of affirmative action for women in some ways, in some stages in different areas of society, but in principle, I'm much more doubtful about whether one could ever achieve, in part, what the goals of, say, the diversity deans have for gender equality. It just seems that there may be some kinds of fundamental complexities or difficulties there. Mm -hmm. um, you've talked about Larry Summers. I mean, I, I also raise a certain other point, which is that you know, it, there could be, and I don't say this as a black and white or an absolute, there could be fundamental limits to gender equality in certain respects maybe a Nobel Prize winning physicist on the faculty or it could be in all other you know, number of other ways. Mm -hmm. And so if the goal is impossible somehow or con contrary to nature, but we are set on it, and of course, if, if you're not willing to admit that the goal is, Im is somehow impossible, of course you will, tr you'll, you know, like a five-year plan to the communists, of course you'll send in tougher, you know, <laughs> management and more ruthless uh, communist, communist apparatchiks because mm -hmm. If you believe in the five-year plan, then obviously there's something going wrong at the management level. So, you know, I guess I would, in a way, make a plea to, to a certain degree to separate these goals, because I do think that America can be, you know, in practice it will maybe never be perfect, but it can be, in, on a pragmatic level, a goal of complete racial equality. I don't know gender equality, if that is in principle possible, <coughs> if it is a free society and if women continue to make certain choices on average as a group that are different. Why do you assume there can be racial equality? You wouldn't assume it if I brought up the NBA. You would, you, would, you would easily concede to me that there are physical differences. There's a reason why 90% of the players in the NBA are black. It's not because they discriminate. Oh, yeah, them. but I'm not I'm talking about it. Yeah, yeah so why do, you assume, why do you assume that, that the intellectual ability is such that there's inherent equality among the races? Well, there would be intermarriage and interbreeding to the point where those racial differences would not would cease to be significant. And for example, the Sephardic and Ashkenazi Jews now intermarried at a rate high enough to eliminate those differences over another five or six generations. So I, you know, there, again, there may not be absolute, because there will be, as, a, as you say, there, may, there could be some kind of genetic differences amongst the races that's possible. But over time, again, through intermarriage, most people are average, so <laughs> they'll marry each other. Um, uh, I don't know, I guess I just put this out there as, as to whether these there isn't, uh, there aren't different challenges depending on whether we're talking about gender or race. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, okay, I don't know about perfect racial equality, but I can see that as being a fundamental goal because I don't think the color of someone's skin is inherently, uh, you know, as important as as their physical gender. I mean, I guess that's, you know, that's to me, in my mind. I understand there could be some kind of belt, or I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Well, um, right, so intermarriage for race, then we get rid of race. So we'll, we'll, we'll just, just no we'll just bracket that. We'll bracket that. That's what as I mean, that, that it's a kind of, <coughs> so he's racism is somehow it's insane. A, it's based on a kind of ridiculous scientific or moral view yeah. where it's at, at, at bottom, whereas, whereas gender is not it's somehow natural, and therefore yeah, well, yeah, principle, to, pro, di a different well, kind of problem. Yeah, I've been to women's studies, obviously, that gender is constructed, but anyway. Well, that would be the alternative. I just think that that's a much more harder selling that's a harder sell. Yeah, well, mind. but I, I guess, I mean, one issue is, 
is the issue of outcomes versus process. And you're saying we expect racially equal outcomes, but it's wrong to have gender ex expectations of racially gender equal outcomes. And I guess I would just say I would give up on outcomes, period. That as long as an inst and and I guess, but the, so I would say don't worry about engineering outcomes if you can be certain that your procedures are fair. How can you track and quality then, of opportunity except by looking at outcomes? Each I institution, I don't think that, I don't think that each institution is responsible for what happens outside of it. Its responsibility is to make sure that it is treating everybody who comes before it with immaculate fairness. And I am absolutely confident that everybody in a university today is capable of doing that. I, I refuse, you will never convince me that that there are faculty at Harvard who are discriminating against qualified female and minority faculty hirings. I don't believe it. Heather, excuse me, there's a other class coming in. Okay, so we have all right. To As, and, and so um, whether the lack of equality of outcomes proves that there's discrimination, I just don't believe it. Anyway. Thank you on. very much for the presentation.